Well, this is it. We've made it to the seventh church in Revelation chapter 3, starting in verse 14. It's the church of Laodicea, the lukewarm church. And I can already imagine this will probably be a little over 15 minutes today. Hopefully you have time. Um, this is the church of today. When does the time period start? Well, it's a good question. Some might say it started in the 1900s, uh, early 1900s, but 20th century, really. Moving on into today, it is this lukewarm church. And so, good morning, Arla, and good morning, Dad, and Steve, and Lisa, and everyone else who's hopping on. So, this is the apostate church, the lukewarm church. Um, man, there's just so much to take in. I don't know, my brain's getting overloaded already. Well, let's see here. <laughs> um, so to the angel of the church of Laodicea, write, these things says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Um, so Jesus is starting this uh, letter to the church and You'll notice it's the church of Laodicea. And this might be a funny point. Um, Laodicea was founded uh, by Antiochus II, um, and he named it after his wife, Laodice, or Laodice. I don't know how to spell it. D-I-C-E, however that's spelled. But it's just kind of funny because you can actually take that word and break it apart into the Greek roots. And Laos is where we get laity from. It's that, that word for, you know, people. And uh, decay, uh, the ending part, actually means to rule. And it's, it's kind of like the people are ruling in this church. Uh, it's a church where the people want it their way. Now, we could easily flip over to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and 2 Timothy chapter 4, where it talks about the people with itching ears who are going to raise up for themselves teachers in the last days because they want their ears tickled. They, 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 they want to hear what they want to hear. Um, I recently read a George Whitfield quote that says that pretty much a sermon is a waste if it either doesn't leave the person offended with the preacher or offended with themselves. And there's some truth to that. You know, I think, I do think every sermon, you know, unless you set aside one where the real specific purpose, um, they, they need to show us the issues, they need to identify the problems, and then they need to identify the solution, right? All problem and no solution is just a, a beating that we don't need. And, and all solution with no problem, well, it's like you're not going to convince a patient to take medicine until you show them that they have an illness. Um, but these people, they don't want to hear that. They just want to hear messages that they want to hear. And Jesus' introduction, as we also we talked about how his introduction always relates to the letter, this introduction, he is the amen, which means so be it or true. And it is to contrast this church. He is faithful. He is a true witness, which is to contrast this church. And Jesus, just again referring to who he is, the beginning, the arche, the, 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 the renderer, the source, the origin of the creation of God. Interesting is that in the Laodicea is mentioned elsewhere in the Bible. Who knows where else Laodicea is mentioned? I know there's a lag, so I, I don't know if you actually are going to comment in time on, not, on that. But the book of Colossians, chapter 2, chapter 4, Colossians is, is supposed to, the letter went to Colossae, but it, then it was shared with the Laodiceans, and they were supposed to trade letters. We don't know what letter Paul wrote Laodicea, but what we do know is very familiar with the letter to Coloss the Colossians, which um, Jesus Christ, the firstborn, the heir firstborn uh, over all creation, uh, by whom all things are made, through whom all things are made, for whom all things are made. And so that last part of that introduction is awfully familiar to this church. All right. I'm really glad to have all you guys today. It's just... Uh, this is a message that we all really need to hear. All right, so 
Verse 15, I know your works. You know, that's just something I'm just pausing real fast because remember, Jesus knows our works. He knows our thoughts and the intents of our hearts. And it should be both comforting and terrifying at the same time that Jesus knows everything you think and you cannot hide a thing from him. And while he sees the darkest of our secrets, he also, he, he, he knows the desires. You know, he understands the intents uh, when we so desperately wish we could quit, so desperately wish we could begin being faithful in things. He sees that too. And so it's kind of something we need to keep in balance. But he tells them, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. And I've been saving this for a special occasion. Now, I know it's backwards for you guys, but this is my uh, Revelation chapter 3 coffee mug. Coffee either hot or cold. Otherwise, I want to vomit it out of my mouth. So, let's look at this stuff, because this is obviously the part that, like, people are familiar with this. And I just got up. Okay, so, it says, I wish, all right? Ophelon, in the Greek, it, 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 it means to, to have a frustrating longing. Okay, it's not just a, I wish upon a star, I wish this or that. It's like a great longing. One second. Hey, Hannah, can you go upstairs, baby? You have a flashlight, I see that. Upstairs, Tinker. Okay. <laughs> so he has this frustrating longing, okay? And he wants them to be hot or cold. And it says, but because they're not hot or cold, they're this lukewarm, I will, I, and it literally in the Greek means I'm about to vomit you out of your mouth. And in the Greek, vomit means vomit. To vomit out of their mouth because it's disgusting to him. Now, there's a little history to this that's helpful, but I, I don't think it's, it's the main takeaway. You see, Laodicea imported water from two directions. And, and one place, it was actually a hot spring that came in. And the other place, it was kind of glacier water that came in. They tried to import hot and import cold. But the irony is, by the time it traveled the distance, aqueducts and whatnot, to Laodicea, both of them came out kind of warm. <laughs> the cold water got warm. The hot water got warm. They just kind of centered in the middle. And they didn't have very good tasting water there. And they understand that it would have been nice if they could have had the hot or cold, but they didn't get it. But here's the thing now. What is Jesus trying to tell this church? Well, you could say hot and cold could mean zealous for God is hot. And what's cold then? Is it totally unsaved? Well, I don't know. You could take it that way, maybe and maybe not. I think people get really bent over this and I think you could correctly interpret it two different ways. First off, the idea is just decisiveness. Hot and cold doesn't have to mean good and bad, but it, at least it's a fixed position. It's a fixed position with some certainty to it. It's not a wishy-washy. It's not a, I don't know, maybe this, maybe that. There's certainty to those positions. And so then if you look at... Um, the idea, though, of burning with zeal, that the believer is supposed to be like the rising sun that burns ever brighter and ever hotter unto the perfect day. You know, that's the idea with us, is that we are supposed to be zealous and burn for the Lord. Why would he ever want us to be cold then, if that could be the opposite of zealous? Well, there, there's something worth noting here, is that, are these people in this church he's talking to saved? And I don't know. 
I wasn't there. But I'll tell you what, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit because it might help us understand. He tells them that because you say you have become wealthy and have, have no need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Um, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. Now these items, there's specific relations to Laodicea. Go listen to my long message from a few years ago if you want to get all that. But, but he, I've never heard Jesus Christ describe a saved person as poor, naked, blind, wretched, miserable. Um, that word miserable there is used in 1 Corinthians 15 for the people who deny the resurrection. So, I don't know if these guys are saved. I just don't know. They, they might not be. Remember, well, it's a church. Well, right, it's a church. Church means assembly. Ecclesia means at, called out to the assembly. Ek is out, so you actually have to go out to assemble. Dare I say, you know, this is like a great thing that we do, but it's not actually like the assembling because we actually have to go out somewhere to assemble. Um, and that's the idea of going to the church and gathering together, going to a place where we all assemble in the physical form. But this is an assembling of people. It doesn't mean you had to be saved to go. And sometimes it's actually better if there's just people who are saved and zealous and they're representing the Lord Jesus Christ properly, they're not, oh, I'll just pause that, not what they're not. And then there's these other people. We call them unbelievers, dare I say, damned, going to hell, and everyone knows it. <laughs> but then there's this group in the middle that no one really knows exactly what to do with. Some of them sure don't look saved, but they actually are. And some of them might look saved, but they're not. Some of them are professing with their mouth, I'm a Christian. And with that same mouth, they still curse and they still do all this other stuff. And the world's watching them, these guys, and they're confused. So we have to understand Jesus doesn't wish anyone's unsaved, but in some senses, that would actually make sense just because they're not doing any harm to the church. This group is. You guys know it's true. Tell me, what's the number one thing that people complain about of why they don't want to go to church? I'll be honest, I, I always hear the same answer. Typically, why people don't want to be a part of a church. And it's hypocrisy. Again, and again, and again. I see these people who call themselves Christians, and yet they still treat me like this. They call themselves Christians, but then they go off and do all the same stuff that I'm doing, and I'm being told that I'm wrong for doing them. People hate hypocrisy. Jesus hates hypocrisy. And it, it's detrimental to the testimony and the witness of the church. And so... Hot or cold? He's saying, man, get in or get out. Quit playing games because it's going to hurt the church. It's going to hurt my testimony. And so he's encouraging them to get that refined gold, the white garments. Again, if they don't have white garments, that's a sign. And then he says in verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, what does he want them to do? Be zealous and repent. So regardless of any debates about what warm means, what hot means, what cold means, and all that, he gives us a very direct, at least, command. Be zealous for God and repent of your sins. Quit doing all that stuff that makes the church look bad. 
and be zealous and start doing all the stuff that Christians have been commanded in the Bible to do. Quit with the sins of commission and quit with the sin of omission of not being zealous for God. Remember, you know, it's one thing to stop doing the bad stuff. It's something totally different to start doing the things you know you're supposed to be doing. And then live transparently before the world, testifying that you're a messed up sinner saved by grace alone. And thank God that when you still struggle with these sins, it's not because you're good and it's not because you get good. It's just simply because of Jesus yeah, man, I'm still messed up too, but Jesus is getting me through this and it's only because of him. And that might make sense to the people over here. Oh, you're not a hypocrite. No, I'm not saying one thing and doing another. I'm saying one thing and that is, is that I messed up and I make mistakes, but Jesus will still forgive me because I've got faith that he will forgive me because I'm trying my best. I'm putting all my faith in him and it's all about him. And so he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. And he who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I, over, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says in the churches. And I know you think we're done, but we're not because the standing at the door and knocking. Now, it, this is an invitation to a church, Right? It's an invitation to a church. You know, it might be a church full of unbelievers, so maybe it's inviting them to salvation, but you know, more so, this really is though, it's the letter of the churches and it, it is a good reminder. This is an invitation for you and for me to have intimate fellowship with the Lord. I'm gonna flip and do a whole new study now. You ready? Where am I going? You'll never know. Song of Solomon, chapter five, verse two. I love Song of Solomon. I sleep, but my heart is awake. It is the voice of my beloved. He knocks saying, open for me, my sister, my love. My dove, my perfect one. That's, that's what Jesus thinks about you and me. My head is covered with dew, my locks with the drops of the night. I've taken off my robe. How can I put it on again? I've washed my feet. How can I defile them? That's our pathetic excuse to not answer the door. My beloved put his hand on the latch of the door, and my heart yearned for him. I arose for my beloved, and my hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with liquid myrrh on the handles of the lock. I opened for my beloved, but my beloved had turned and gone away and was gone. You see, Jesus, like to the later seasons, he's a gentleman. He won't force us to go be with him. He won't force us to get alone with him. He won't force us to be blessed with his presence and his power and his love. He'll stand at the door and he'll knock and he'll, he'll, he'll woo us. He'll call to us. He'll whisper in our ears, my dove, my perfect one. But we got to get up off the couch. <laughs> we got to get out of bed. Right? So take that as you want. Got to get out of bed. And so she goes, as I sought for him and I could not find him, I called, but he gave no answer. And, and what ends up happening is she goes around the city and she ends up being abused and goes through all this trouble. It's amazing when we forsake that fellowship and we don't get up to be with him, how everything else seems to just fall apart in life. Just recently, I uh, was rereading you know, William Wilberforce, and he was the guy who abolished slavery in, in England and a disciple of John Newton who wrote Amazing Grace, a pupil. And, and, and he said, you know, all this busyness and all this socialization, he's like, it's going to be the death of me. I need earlier hours and more solitude. He knew the answer to his problems. And so she goes around and then 
she's trying to find her beloved again and she can't and she's getting abused by these guys and these women. They ask her in, in verse nine, what is your beloved more than any other? And you know what? When we don't treat him like our beloved, that's what we make the world think. Why would I ever want to be a Christian? You don't seem any more loved or any different than anyone else. But that's not the message we need to send to them. We need to show them transformed lives. We need to show them hearts on fire so that when we say, I'm a Christian, people go, you're different. So she begins to describe him. She begins to boast about him. She begins to rave about her beloved in these next few verses and just describing how amazing he is. And then all of a sudden they want in now. Now that they see this woman on fire and passionately in love for him, they want in. And so in chapter six, like, well, where did he go? And so she goes, he's back with the flocks. And he goes, she goes there and she finds him. And there's something beautiful there because that's where they first met. You know, they met in the fields. He was a shepherd in disguise. And that's what Jesus tells the church of Ephesus. Wrapping up all these seven churches. You've lost the love. Repent and go back and do the first works. David says, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. That's what we have to do. We never want to become like that church of Laodicea. And you know, it's that losing the love that could turn us into this lukewarm, doesn't care, doesn't change kind of a church that just has itching ears that want to be tickled. We need to show the world that the Lord Jesus Christ is amazing. He is our beloved. He will transform and he will change and he will move. And so let us be hot for him that we might win over the hearts that are so cold. He says, I stand at the door and knock. He probably got a key, <laughs> but he's not going to barge in. He's going to wait for you to get out of bed, dare I say, in the morning before everyone else gets up. Psalm 63, early I will seek you. It also says in the midnight watches. So early and late, David was seeking the Lord. Jesus got up long before the sun to pray. When he didn't get up long before the sun, it's because he started the night before and he was still praying. We get up to answer the door so that we can have our beloved come in once again for intimacy. That's what it is in that story. You know, Song of Solomon's pretty, uh, pretty uh, hot and sweaty of a book, but that's the, the idea. And some people don't like that, but there's an intimacy there that we can physically understand in physical intimacy, but it's symbolic of a deeper intimacy, a spiritual intimacy that can happen where two become one. And that's what Jesus wants to do with you. You have to get past the physical with, that, that he wants to be one with you and you with him, a depth and an intimacy. So I could turn this into a 45 minute message and I'm not going to. So the church of Laodicea and Psalm, a Psalm in chapter five is a bonus. I love you guys. And so hopefully this isn't the first thing you wake up to. Because often by this time of day, time is going to run out and this world's going to whisk you away. Unless you have a leisurely schedule. <laughs> but get up. Wake up and arise when he knocks. Let him enter in. To have that intimacy with you so that you might burn with just fervent heat for him. God bless you guys. Have an amazing day.